Hi, welcome. My name is Sophia Renville, the Director of Scholarship Program at the National Alliance for the Advancement of Haitian Professional, NHAP, is a nonprofit organization committed to provide educational and professional opportunities to Haitian professionals. Every day we strive to make an impact by empowering the Haitian community through scholarships, mentorship, networking, and other career opportunities. Would you like to help us in this cause? All you need to do is to create an account on Amazon Smile and select the National Alliance for the Advancement of Haitian Professionals as your charity, and Amazon will automatically send us a small donation for every purchase you make at no cost to you. Creating an account on Amazon Smile is super simple. Just go to smile.amazon.com. Tap on the Get Started button, then click on the Create Your Amazon account at the bottom. Enter your name, email address, select the password, and tap on Create Your Amazon account. So to solve the proposal and then verify your account by using one-time password you will receive in your inbox. After the ad, after that, add your phone number to say to for safety, and boom, you have successfully created your account. Now the most important step is to type in the search bar National Alliance for the Advancement of Haitian Professionals. Then select NHAP as your charity. Tap on the box that says yes, I understand, and then click on start shopping. That's it. You successfully added NHAP to your charity. Just make sure to always start shopping at smiles.amazon.com. Thank you for your support. Let's create a better future together. Greetings and welcome to College Planning with the National Alliance for the Advancement of Haitian Professionals. My name is Dr. Ketsia Alert Sadler, and I'm the founder of College Cafe and your moderator for this webinar series. We welcome you this evening because we will be talking about financial aid and how do you get the money. For all our high school seniors who are listening, you should be getting ready because October 1st is that magic date when all the forms become available. But before we get started with our program, I'd like to thank some of our partners. We have Shokalela, Book and Write Accountancy, the NAHP, Golden V and Parent Matters, who is one of uh, College Cafe's partners in other en endeavors that we've done over the summer. So we're really thankful to uh, our other partners, Shokalela, Book It Right Accountancy, Golden V, and College Cafe for sponsoring and for helping us with this vital program. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, speakers, panelists for the evening. We first have Miss Christine Peterson, who is not a stranger to our program. And so we'd like to thank her for coming back and taking time to talk to everyone this evening. And Miss Peterson is currently employed as the Associate Director of Financial Aid at Hudson County Community College in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, for five years. And she's served prior to that as the Director of Financial Aid at Lincoln Technical Institute in South Plainfield, New Jersey. She's got more than 20 years of experience in financial aid and more than 30 years in education in various roles. Her volunteer work includes serving as president of the NJASFAA, which is the New Jersey Association of Financial Aid Administrators, and she's currently secretary of the Eastern Association of Financial Aid Administrators and has been members of these associations for more than 20 years. She holds a bachelor's degree from St. Peter's University and is currently pursuing a master's in higher education from Capella University. Welcome again, Ms. Peterson. And our new partner and expert in financial aid is Ms. Jamila Barker. Uh, Ms. Barker believes that everyone has their role to play in the advancement of our youth. She has worked in financial aid for nearly 20 years. The New Jersey Higher Education Student Association Authority, New Jersey HESA, has been her home for the past 17 years. Within her role as an outreach and communication specialist, her primary goal is to disseminate information and resources to families to assist in their pursuit of education. As the state liaison for New Jersey high schools, colleges, and community organiza organizations, she is tasked with training and educating on the financial aid process. She regularly provides in personal and virtual presentations on college planning, completing FAFSA, Financial Aid 101, Secondary School Counselors Workshops, and Financial Literacy Modules. She has made it her mission to share the knowledge she has acquired. Ms. Barker received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology from Fairleigh Dickinson University, the Metropolitan Campus, and has earned her Master of Leadership and Public Administration degree from Centenary College. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, 
the NAACP, as well as professional organizations such as New Jersey Coalition of Financial Educators and New Jersey Association of Financial Aid Administrators. Of all her accomplishments, she is most proud of being the mother of Caleb Isaiah Barker. Welcome, Ms. Barker. And as I said, welcome, ladies, and thank you so much for wanting to share with us. As we were saying prior to the broadcast, financial aid is so important, and so many of our families do not realize how early they actually have to start with this process, but everybody wants the money, but sometimes they don't want to fill out the form. So tonight, we're going to share with them all the vital information on what they need to do to get the money. So let's start with a first question on what forms are required for students to apply for financial aid. So who wants to start, Christine or Jamila? Yeah, I can, I can start, okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sadler. It's a great introduction that you gave us. And um, as everyone should know, or make a note of, uh, financial aid begins with the FAFSA application. That's the free application for federal student aid. You can go to studentaid.gov and uh, find that application. And also one thing to remember, the first F in FAFSA stands for free. So go to onlystudentaid.gov because there are other sites out there that will charge you $25, $50, $100. And so if they are looking for a fee, get out of that site quickly and go back to studentaid.gov because you don't have to spend a penny on filing this application. And as Dr. Sadler brought up, uh, every October 1st, a new financial aid application becomes available. And you should pay attention to award years because right now we're in the 22-23 award year. And uh, the new application that's going to come out in October 1st is for the 23-24 award year. Meaning that if you're going to start college next fall of 2023, you need to do the 23-24 application that's coming out. So if you're currently attending school now in the fall of 22 and the spring of 23, you need to do the 22-23 application. I know that's a lot of 20s available, you know, in the years, but it's important to pay attention to that because you want to make sure that you fill out the right application for the semester that you're attending school. Otherwise, if you don't, you're not going to get any aid. So it's important that you've... Um, you know, pay attention to that because after October 1st, you're going to see two award years there available. So, um, so try to pay attention to that and um, make sure you fill it out every year. Every year that you're going to attend school, you need to complete the FAFSA and you're going to use tax return information two years prior. That's what we call prior, prior year. So now for 22-23, you're using the 2020 federal tax return. And you only need to think of the federal tax return, not your state tax return, just federal. So for 23-24, you're going to use the 2021 federal application. And you're going to go there and you're going to complete the information. The first like 35 questions are basic information like your name, address, social security number, date of birth, that kind of information. And um, then if you're a dependent student, and I won't go into too much about that right now because that's a later question, but you're going to, if you're 18 years old, um, this is your first time going to school, you're not married or have a child, you're really considered a dependent student, so you're going to need your parents' information. And you're going to get their uh, federal tax return and um, put their information and also their name and um, how many um, social security numbers and um uh, information like that. So, um, and you're going to complete the FAFSA and you're going to make sure that you sign it. Okay. You need to sign the uh, form and um, you do that by creating a FSA ID for you. And then for one of your parents, you also need to create an FSA ID um, so that they can sign the application too. And then don't forget to click on the submit button and um, so that your FAFSA is processed. And also, um, there's going to be an, a question where uh, they'll ask for the schools that you want this information sent to. And there's a list of codes that they'll give you. So you just need to click on the school if you're planning on attending community college or like Rutgers or 
uh, Rowan University or any of the state universities or anywhere in the United States, you need to click, make sure you include that school that you want this information to get to. Okay, if you don't, then um, they're not gonna have any FAFSA on you. So um, you need to uh, make sure you put those school codes on there. So um, did, I think that answers that question. Um, Jamila, did I miss anything? Okay, so when we're talking about the different applications, there's also something, um, the CSS profile where there's roughly 400 um, schools that would require that. And basically that's to determine more in-house money, not federal or state money. So if there's a big endowment or the school has certain loans that they'll give, you know, that that's the application. So it looks um, deeper, let's say, into the information that's actually put on to the FAFSA. So that also comes out October 1. There's a um, um, cap. So if the family's adjusted gross income is $100,000 and lower, then there's no cost to complete the CSS profile. However, if that income is higher, then it's $25 for the first CSS profile and then an additional $16 for each additional. So although the FAFSA, you fill out one FAFSA, you list your school. For the CSS profile, you it's $25 for the first, $16 additional. And please don't just, you go to student um, aid, no, cssprofile.board.org to complete the CSS profile. However, only complete it if the school requires it. There's no need to pay money, right? That's the thing. We want money. We don't want to pay money. So let's be careful um, with that. And also there's that other step in terms of to see if you're a New Jersey resident going to school in the eligible New Jersey school People would like to think that there's a separate application to apply for state funds. It's not, okay? So the state will receive your FAFSA information if you're a New Jersey resident, okay? The state will receive it and then will consider for um, to see if a student is eligible or not. So there are different paths that you can take the, to determine whether or not you're eligible follow along, the schools will let you know which applications are required, okay? But I think that that sort of sums it up. If the institution, um, they may have their own separate application, all right, for need-based aid or things like that, communicate with the school communicate with the financial aid offices so that you can make sure you've completed every application that you need because we want you to get money. Whatever you're eligible for, we want you to get it. Okay, so meet deadline. Yes, and, and I can testify to the fact of schools requiring an additional form because both my boys went to private schools and we, and at the time I had a side business. So there were these business forms and you had to put in your business profits versus loss and your expected projection of how much you were going to make that year. So yes, additional forms. So I made sure that I was always on the financial aid page of the schools to see what forms are required, what deadlines were needed to be met. And of course, had to see, did I need to do these forms every year, which you always had to do. And I think I, I was so excited with, with my younger son because he did the four years and his junior, I was like, yes, I only have to do this one more time. And then his senior, he's like, my, I gotta go back for another semester. So I almost had, had a panic attack of having to do those forms all over again. But I like the CSS profile, as you said, because it goes into so much more detail, but I was willing to give up that information and pay the fee for the schools that required it in order to get that additional funding. So I was quite thankful 
to have to do that. So thank you for, for that information, ladies. And so we, we talked a little bit about the different aid of the federal versus school and state-based. So are there federal school and state-based aid? So are there any additional information you want to give more on the whether it's the federal, state level, any differences between them and loans and grants, things like that coming from the different schools? Okay, I can talk about the federal, okay? And um, for federal aid, once you file this, the FAFSA, you could be eligible for a Pell Grant. What will happen is you'll receive what we call the EFC, an estimated family contribution, which determines how much money you, re you will receive in a Pell Grant. And um, the award amount will be for the award year. And I think we're up to a little over 6,800 or so for this award year um, for a Pell Grant. So um, that's why it's important to file the FAFSA as soon as possible. Also, with the federal grants, you may receive SEOG, which is a Supplement Educational Opportunity Fund. It's additional money that schools award from the uh, federal government. And then also federal work study is also a grant. This allows students, um, the work study program is excellent because it allows students to work on campus to get some work experience and also to earn some money to help pay for their um, education. So those are the three possibilities of grants from uh, the uh, federal, uh, on the federal side. Also, you could be eligible for loans. They're called direct student loans. And there's the subsidized and the unsubsidized uh, loans. The difference is that with the subsidy, we try to encourage if they do need to take out loans, we don't encourage people to take out loans, but if they do, um, to take out the subsidized loan because the interest on that loan is paid by the federal government. With the unsub loan, uh, the interest accrues while you're in school. So, um, so if you want to save some money on your interest, take the subsidized loan. And uh, there's an amount available for the first award year, first time student, it's $3,500 for the year for subsidized and $2,000 for an independent and $3,000 for a, um, or actually $6,000 in the unsub for an independent student. So there's loan amounts uh, there that are available and it increases for as you progress um, going on to be a sophomore, junior, senior, the amounts go up. So um, those are the grants and the loans. And also, um, what else? Am I leaving anything out? Also, I just wanted to talk about eligibility um, and um, if you are to determine your eligibility too, you need to be a citizen or an eligible non-citizen. You need to have a high school diploma or an equivalent, a GED. You need to be enrolled in a degree or certificate program at your school, have a valid social security number, and you need to maintain academic progress and demonstrate a financial need. Those are like the basic requirements that go with your eligibility in addition to your adjusted gross income based on you know how much your, um, your, you or your parents make uh, for the year. That determines the amount of money that you're eligible for. So I just wanted to um, you know, make you aware of that. And also Jamila can talk about the alternative application too that's available if you are not a citizen or an eligible non-citizen. Okay, Jamila. Okay, so I just wanna go back really quickly. When we talk college work study, it is a grant, but I need you, everyone to know if your package is a need based grant, okay? If you are packaged for college work study, it does not come off of your invoice. It does not come off of the invoice that you get for the school. The student earns the money and they receive the check. It's a family decision. If they choose to use that as their pocket money, they can. If they've made that agreement with the parents that they will use that money to help pay down towards their education, that's up to you, but it will not be deducted from your award letter. So you will see that there. Um, just, as, just as was mentioned, 
for the FAFSA, you have to be a U, the student has to be a U.S. citizen, eligible non-citizen. We're not speaking about the parent. The parent can um, be undocumented for the student to complete the FAFSA. Now, for students, for New Jersey, if a student does not have a social security number, if they're not a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen, New Jersey said, okay, for federal, you can't apply for the FAFSA. But we do have something called the New Jersey Alternative Application. So you would complete that right on New Jersey's website, the www.hesaa.org. Remember, this is for students that are not U.S. citizens or eligible non-citizens, and you'll go on, it mirrors the FAFSA form. The difference here is we will see if you're eligible for state funding, not federal, okay? So you have to be a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen for federal money. For the alternative application, you could be eligible for state money, but you're going to go through the same process as citizens or eligible non-citizens. So all of the income information, we're gonna calculate how many people in the household, age of oldest parent, how many people in college, all of the same criteria that's used to determine federal funds, New Jersey uses that to determine state funds. Now, there are grants and scholarships, right, that comes from the state, that the state offers. So for instance, there's, um, most people will hear about the New Jersey Stars program. Um, that's for County College, right? You are the top 15% of your junior high school graduating class, or you can move up actually when you're a senior to be in that top 15% of the class. That's when you may be eligible to attend your local county college, right? five years, so think about it, tuition paid if you're in that top 15% going to the local county college. Now, you graduate in five years, you have a 3.25 cumulative average. Apply for the four-year college. You apply for the four-year, it no longer pays full tuition, but it does become a grant. So you can be eligible for that. New Jersey, oh my gosh, New Jersey has so much. We have um, our main grant is the New Jersey Tuition Aid Grant, TAG, people know that. For So as soon as we get your FAFSA, that's when we start seeing for all of our need-based funds, we'll start calculating whether or not you're eligible for that. So there's um, CCOG, Community College Opportunity Grant, Christine, I, I, this is like our, we're going on our third year, I believe, of that. So that is strictly based on the parent's adjusted gross income. Now I'm saying parents, when we move on to which students are independent, considered independent or dependent, then we'll discuss, but for right now, I'll say that a dependent student, the parent's adjusted gross income, $65,000, or under, you can go to your county college for tuition and fees, right? Approved fees, imagine that. They didn't have that when I was in school, right? So you can do that, that's fine. You have your CCOG, oh my gosh, there's so much because there is a college promise where you can move on. Let's say like this, okay? There are ways to go to college. We just have to go for anything that's out there. New Jersey has a scholarship, we have a grant, www.hess, sorry, hesaa.org. It has a full list. We have federal and state scholarships as well as grants that's there. We also have a New Jersey class loan that is not a federal loan, okay? that's a private loan, a supplemental loan. So that's different. Whereas federal loans, they're not gonna check your credit. They're not gonna check for a certain amount of income for the student. The federal direct loan, that's in the student's name. When we move on to private loans, then yes, there's gonna be a certain interest rate 
I'm sorry, a certain um, credit score that you have to have, a certain amount of income that you have. So that's where things get a little sticky, where you have to determine who's eligible, who should you use um, if you need a co-signer. For most um, private loans, a student, you know, a dependent student, you're going to need a co-signer. Okay, maybe the student can be the borrower for that. But if I'm not mistaken, I think we have covered, well, you know what, outside scholarships. There's a host of outside scholarships that um, we left out, whether it's um, for sports, what we call merit-based aid. We discussed um, need-based aid, right? But there's, there's a merit-based aid, such as the New Jersey Star, right? Um, there is, New Jersey has something um, called the New Jersey Governor's Industry Vocational Scholarship, strictly because um, you can fill it out if you're a woman or minority going to school towards um, construction, engineering. That's really... Um, separate aside, because normally you have to go to a four-year accredited institution for that. But with the NJ Gives, that's not the case. You can go to the technical school. Now, let me know if I said for New Jersey state time, you have to be a U.S. resident for 12 years, 12 months or more, as well as attend an eligible New Jersey institution. So right off the bat, when you know that you're going to stay in New Jersey, you want to determine whether or not you're eligible for New Jersey state funds. I think we're good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to add one or two other things. Um, on the community college grant, um, there's also tier one and tier two. Jamila uh, mentioned tier one where it's up to 65,000. She's now saying yes, <laughs> she knows. But there's also tier two, where you'll get half of what the CCOG maximum is if your income is $80,000 and less. That is something new for this year. And um, the CCOG original was started in the spring of 2019, and it was always subject to renewal every year, but now it's permanent. So we don't have to worry about the governor saying no, or we don't have any money, it's permanent now. But this was the first year that they came up with tier two. So for $80,000 adjusted grow income and lower uh, and to up to 65,001, you may be eligible for tier two of CCOJ. And you just have to remember too, that you register for at least six credits and you're enrolled in a degree or certificate program. OK. And then the other thing about um, this, the direct loans, um, Jamila mentioned, yes, just by filling out the FAFSA, you're eligible for the student loans that I talked about, which is in the student's name. But there's also the Parent PLUS loan under the direct loan program that parents can take out uh, monies to help their children uh, fund their education. And the parent uh, plus loan is based on credit. So you need to be a credit worthy borrower or have a co-signer to that loan if you're not. But there's parent plus loans that are also available. Um, and then um, Jamila mentioned scholarships. Um, the institutions might have scholarships like Hudson County Community College has the foundation scholarships that you can, that can apply for that come from the college or you can go to scholarships.com or FineAid, and um, you, there is thousands and thousands of scholarships available. Consider it a home, your first homework assignment. Go to these sites and you can put in, they ask for information, which will help you narrow the search uh, because there are so many. And then they'll tell you which scholarships, uh, once you put in the information, some of them may be based on your major. Some may be based on the town that you live in. Some may be your religious background or your ethnic background. 
they have all different criteria, and it's not just based on academics or your grade point average. It could be any one of the things that I mentioned. So go to these sites, scholarships.com or FineAid, and you put in the information and it'll help you um, to look at scholarships that you might be eligible for. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I'm thinking about this. And guys, I tell you, there's a host of New Jersey grants and scholarships. And I can kick myself because the educational opportunity grant, okay, that is major. That's a major one, okay? So normally what do they say? It's for economically disadvantaged um, students, first generation students. When we spoke about application, in order to be um, considered for EOS, that's a separate application. So when you're filling out your admissions applications, you have to let them know that you would like to be considered for EOS. That's something different at the EOS office. And what do you get? You get academic um, help. You go in early. You get to meet people in your class. You go into school already with credits. So you're ahead of the game already. So that is something that I strongly encourage. Now, yes, is looking at the historical income of the family. So that's why it's beyond the FAFSA. The FAFSA looks at two years prior. But when you're looking to be considered for EOF, the school may say, okay, I want to see three years back of income or, you know, something like that. But I was an EOF. My sister was EOF. She had a great time, meaning it really enhanced her college experience. She was eligible. When I came along, we weren't eligible. Yay, mom, for making more money. But no. <laughs> well, what was funny in, in, in my household when the boys were in school, I would tell my husband, you don't get a raise this year because every time you make a little bit more money, we're going to get less than financial aid. So let's stay where we are. Now they are thankfully out of school. So all bets are off. Make as much as you want because <laughs> we got to take care of retirement. <laughs> so, yeah, so that that financial piece. But thank you. You ladies dropped some gems about New Jersey State. I hope everyone is taking notes on what's available in the state of New Jersey because we have a lot available for you to go to school. So money should not be the barrier for you to go. Um, so we've mentioned this a few times about dependent versus independent. What What is the difference? What does it mean when well, FAFSA is asking if you're in, independent or dependent? So what, how, how do we explain that to folks? Okay, um, I'll start. Uh, uh, for a dependent student, as we mentioned a, a little bit, a dependent student is usually students that are 18 years old. They're still living at home with mom and dad and um, they uh, are not married or have any children. Um, that's usually a dependent student. An independent student, they're over 24 years old, they're married, have a ch child, um, they're living on their own and supporting themselves without parental help. Um, those are the students that are independent and it just requires uh, their income or um, if they're married, their spouse's income too. So those are the basic differences. Did you want to add anything, Jamila? Oh, sure. On the FAFSA, there's a separate dependency um, section. So it'll have um, the same thing, you know, with adding some more, do you um, support, do you have a child that you support more than 50%? Are uh, you a veteran? Are you, there's a whole, are you under, um, are you a minor that's homeless? There's a host of questions. I believe it's maybe 13 questions there. If you can answer yes to one of those questions, then you would be deemed an independent student. But please don't just answer yes, because if you can answer yes, you have to be able to document it. 
okay? So the FAFSA will let you know whether or not you're dependent or independent. There's no questions about, you, you know, you don't have to try to teeter and figure it out. The FAFSA tells you what, just by answering the questions, whether you're independent or dependent. Okay, because I know that comment has come up in conversations. Oh, I'm, I want to declare myself independent, but it's declaring it and actually being able to prove it on documentation is more difficult. But in the case that like you say, depending on the situation, you might have an 18 year old who maybe has a child who's maybe an orphan. So again, every situation is different, but you have to show the proof on paper of why you qualify to be to be independent. Uh, so thank you for for clarifying that. So uh, you we, know we, what? Go ahead. I'm sorry. While we're on this, when you're completing your FAFSA form, let's put it out there. They're talking about biological parents. Okay. So that will get a little sticky when you're looking at completing your FAFSA and whose information you should put on your FAFSA. So just remember, you're living with um, your aunt, um, a family friend, your grandmother. You don't live with your parents, but your parents are still living, okay? The FAFSA still wants proof, not your grandmother's information, not the person that you're necessarily living with, unless they're your, um, you've been adopted, okay? So, um, Let's just read into that. The FAFSA tells you exactly whose information to put on it. I'm sorry. I just thought, you know, when we're looking at dependent, independent, and things like that, because one of the questions is, are you in a legal guardianship when we look at dependency? So being a court-ordered legal guardianship, that is a question right there that makes a student independent. Okay, so be careful when you're answering the questions. And if you have a question about it, then that's a family conversation. You speak to a family member to determine whether or not you meet that um, category. Okay, thank you. Because definitely we do have those situations where children have to live with, with grandma, but grandma may not be the legal guardian because parents are still alive. So how, how does a student fill out that that information? Who, who do you put down? Or in the cases when you know, children are, you know, parents are, have, are divorced and remarried, like, so which parents' information? I know those situations get really, really sticky when there's the alimony piece. But again, on FAFSA, I believe it does ask for alimony and child support and things like that. So, um, so yes. So let's talk about the piece. We're always talking about the parents' finances, but a lot of time, um, and especially we have an audience that's uh, made up of Haitian families, and I'm one. My parents were not in this category because whatever information I needed for school, they gave me. I filled out FAFSA myself 30 years ago. It was quite easy. Now it's online, a little more complicated. But now we find sometimes that parents are reluctant to give their social security information to their students because they say, well, I don't want any loans in my name. So can we just, again, go go through that a little bit more. Very few might have come late, but just to reemphasize how, what is the parent's role in the financial piece and where would your social security information be required in this process? Okay, I'll start. Um, it is required on the app FAFSA application to put your parents' information, and that includes their social security number and all, and their marital status and everything. And it is a secure site, okay? Um, so they don't have to worry about it unless, of course, there's a breach, which, ha which has happened in the past. But um, what happened was the uh, parents and the students, if they filed a tax return, they are encouraged to use the data retrieval tool, the DRT, we call it. Sometimes parents, um, you know, don't have the information in front of them or anything, but um, and they've made it easier to retrieve that information where it goes to the IRS site and it pulls the information from the actual tax return. So that, and that cuts down on the verification process where 
if a file was selected for verification that we needed all this documentation. But if they use the data retrieval tool, the information comes right in, populates on the FAFSA, so you don't need any other forms. So, and it is secure, um, as secure as anything can be. You know, we, we just, you know, have to say that. And um, it's okay to put that information on. But which brings up a, a social security number brings up another point. If parents are undocumented or they don't have a social security number, some of them have an ITIN number, you know, they're working here in this country and they are paying taxes. Um, if they don't have a social security number, they can put zero zeros in there, you know, and um, that will suffice, but, you know, with their names and everything. So um, that's a way to um, get the file, uh, get the FAFSA filed, you know, if um, students have undocumented parents and all. Do you want to add to that, Jam Jamila? Yes. When you're completing the FAFSA, it's an electronic, right? It's an electronic application. So a student has to get an electronic signature as well as the parent. And that's what they'll use every year. Well, on the FAFSA, the student can sign in and complete the student's portion, and the parents can sign in to complete their own portion. If some parents have that issue, I don't want to give the student my information to complete the application, right? So now let's move to there. They've completed the FAFSA. Parents say, I don't want to get billed, right? That's what you said. The parents don't want to get stuck with the bill. Well, everything goes in the student's name. Okay, the bills come in the student's name. As a matter of fact, we cannot speak to the parent unless the student gives permission to speak to the parent. Okay, so for parents, the bill will never come in your name. You discuss that with your student. Most commonly, the students get the bill, they hand it to the parents, right? That's a family decision. You're going to hear me constantly say that. That's a family decision. So it's up to the student and the family to figure out how that part is going to be played. But parents, please know that you're not going to be able to just call into the financial aid office or call the state to get information about your student unless the student provides proof. It's FERPA, it's a FERPA law, right? It's against the law for us to get inf give information out to the students. So please discuss that ahead of time. The schools all have their forms online so that the students can fill out and give permission so their parents can talk, can you know speak about the money and things like that. But no parents, the bill is not gonna come in your name. When you're completing the FAFSA, it's still the student's FAFSA form, okay? So please, let's help the students, right? The only way that we can figure out how much financial aid is if parents provide that information. Okay, thank you. Because we had a question from the audience, how do you proceed if a parent or guardian doesn't want to share their information on a FAFSA form. So, aha, there's an answer to that. <laughs> that is against New Jersey law, okay? So, technically speaking, if a parent does not give the student their information, refuses to give the student their information, there's a fine that we can assess. Last I knew it was a $500 fine. So that's something where the student and the school, they'll come to the state to say, listen, my parent, I want to go to school. All I need, I need my parents' information. They won't give it to us. That's something where we say, come on, parent, just provide nothing's going to come in your name. You're not going to get a bill in your name. So as a way of trying to help the student get the information. You know, that's something that, that's out there. But students, please don't run and just tell on your parents and say the parents won't give me the information, okay? 
All right. So so let, let me rephrase this so I make sure I'm understanding it. So basically, as long as parents, parents information, even if they give it, whether it's your social and your finances, every bill, every initial loan is all in your child's name. Now, if a parent decides to take out a parent plus loan for their child, that would be in, in their name, correct? Yes, parent plus loans, those are in. Now remember, parent plus loans are different because for the student direct loans, that's in the student's name, so they're not running. Any credit check, they're not looking at any income. The parent plus loan is different, okay? That's in the parent's name. And that's a loan application for the parents, right? So now they're looking at a certain amount of income for the parents to have. So there are cases where the parents are denied the parent plus loan, but there are safeguards, you know, um, different ways for the student to receive additional um, direct loan money, all right? Just remember, these federal loans, there's an aggregate limit every year, okay? So you may owe, if you're a freshman, you may owe um, for your, in, let's say $10,000 you owe. Well, you cannot take out $10,000 in a student loan because there's an aggregate yearly amount, okay? And it's so difficult to discuss this because there's so much to discuss about financial aid, but I think we're hitting all the good points. I know, like we said, everyone's situation is different. Every child's situation in a family is different because as we said before, family's finances change. So the picture looks different. Or if we think about COVID, if your company managed to make it through, say, to 2020 or 2021, now if your company's gone under, your financial picture looks different. So your child's sophomore year finances would look totally different than what it looked freshman year. So... A lot, of, a lot of differences. But I want to go back on a few points before we talk about the loans on a few topics that you ladies mentioned before. So when, well, Ms. Peterson, you were talking about the FAFSA ID. Can Is that something that fam, fam, families can fill out or request before October 1st? So you have it October 1st, or do you have to wait for October 1st to do the FSA ID piece? Because I know that's like a whole separate part you have to do even before you can do FAFSA. Right. The, the FSA ID is really a username and password. And you can create that ahead of time. There's, if you go the same site, studentaid.gov, it'll say create F FSA ID first. That's usually the first thing that you do. So they could do it now. And remember, it's just, there's one separate in a student's name and then one in one of the parents' name. It doesn't have to be both parents. It could just be one parent. OK, and that's a separate one that they have to create. OK, I think I had a financial aid folder that I used for all eight years while the boys were in school. <laughs> Whenever we got to financial aid form time, I pulled out the, the folder because that everyone's FSA ID or whatever, just just so I didn't try to have to remember that, because every day now we've got passwords for your online for banking, your phone bill, whatever. So right. financial aid stuff one location every year you look for it when, when i do a workshop i always ask the question how many people remember their fsa id and there's maybe one or two or, or a handful of people that raise their hands so i always say put it in a place or make it something that's simple that you will always remember you know use a code for yourself to remember it but you know basically put it in a safe place so that you don't have to recreate it every year yeah, because I remember, I, I think I probably started using the folder because I forgot it when I went to do it again. And it was just such a hassle to try to create a new one. It was just frustrating. So believe me, everyone, make save it, put it somewhere safe. Um, so talking about work study. So what happens as work study, it's, it's your job or on campus. It's funds that you're awarded. What happens, say they award you 1200 that school year and your classwork is difficult and you just can't work enough to um, to earn that 1200. What happens the following year? Do you still get 1200? Do they decrease the amount? Like what, what does that 
what does that look and if and we're talking if your family finances have not changed at all but you as a student just couldn't work those hours because of your academic load well first of all it's it's up to you i mean you may be eligible for federal work study but it's up to the student to decide whether they can handle a job and going to school and studying and all that it's up to them and if they get to it if they try it and they want to work on campus and they want to earn some extra money and they try it and their studies are are slacking or something you know their their grades are going down then they could just quit i i mean there's no real obligation there other than i mean they're awarded a certain amount of money they can only work up to 20 hours a week um you know there's stipulations there and they can only earn a certain amount of money you know, some jobs pay, you know, $15 an hour, some pay $13 an hour. It depends on the job that they're in. So, but if they don't use up the money, it's okay. And then every year they, as they file the FAFSA, that's what determines their eligibility for the next year. So, um, but they are not obligated to work the next year at all if they feel that they can't, you know, it's entirely uh, up to the student. Okay. So let's say they don't use the funds, right? Let's say they never get a job on campus. No, that money's not going to um, just be um, refunded to them or, you know, anything. They forfeit it, that money. Let's say that they um, was packaged for $1,200 and they use $700. Well, they didn't use that allotted amount of money, right? Because they were packaged on a semesterly basis for that. So let's keep that in mind. And realistically, work study, you're in a real job. I was a financial aid work study and it taught me, I was able to work and it taught me good habits. And um, I learned my way around the campus. There's people that when they get their work study, they will work in the department that they're majoring in. You're accumulating skills. You're, you know, there's skills involved. So yes, you're earning money. That's a bonus because you're also getting those work skills under your belt. You're able to use it as references. Straight from the financial aid office, I got hired right, as a financial aid counselor, based on my experience. So I loved it. I love work study. I was work study. I was eligible. Okay, I'm done. I'm off. It's okay. I was work study too. I worked in the biology department all four years. I was a bio major. So yes, and 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 that and back then maybe now because I stayed in the same department I got a raise every every year because I stayed in that department. So and and it was great. But the the advantage also was the flexibility with my schedule in that you know if I had to do an extra study session or something, it would say okay and I'd figure out how to work it into the um, into my schedule because I'm there to be a student and not to work. But again, lots of um, skills that I could take into the workforce later on and experience as well that you could put on your resume of having a job for four years. So, so definitely um, that's helpful. And um, so the, the question about EOF, we said before, so how would students know if they're eligible or how would they know if they, sh if they should apply for it, if they're asking um, about EOF? Like how, how would a high school senior know to say, yes, I'm going to apply for EOF or no, I'm not. Should they say they're going to without knowing what the criteria are for it? Okay, let's first, I'm going to, sorry schools, I'm gonna put onus on the school, right? Onus on uh, the high schools, onus on the state because we go out and that's one of the things that we do, right? we put the information out there. A lot of the schools, um, their admissions, when they go out, like the four-year schools, and they go to these college fairs and things like that, the EOS um, counselors are there. Admissions understands that. But listen, that's the key for college fairs when students are attending. 
the college fairs. You know, that's how they know what's going on. Some of the schools, their applications, right? You can click and then EOS will send you that information. When you go on school tours, the EOS offices are there. They, um, most of the times they'll come and speak to the students. But with any of this, students, you hear it today, EOS, you, you know, this is played again. That's when you have to make um, the decision. I'm going to find out what money's out there if I'm eligible for the money. Now, I'm not quite sure what is it. I don't want to give a certain um, income amount, you know, for EOF, right? Because there is an income amount and there's a certain amount of assets that the parent cannot have, you know, above. So there's a criteria in there for that. But if you believe you're um, relatively, we all think we're low income. But if, you know, let's, I don't know, I'm just going to put this out there. Let's say $60,000, something like that. Give it a shot. The EOS, you have to go to the school. Each school, there's no um, direct EOS website because it's manned on each campus. So when you're on the campus, you can go to the school's um, financial aid website, and then you'll find out, okay, EOF office, let me um, go. I'm not quite sure how Hudson, you know, works it on their website with, EOS, but I do know that there are schools that you can get in contact with the EOF office right there, or the EO, the application is directly on the site. Uh, yes, we do have it on our site under paying for college, I believe, under our Hudson County Community College uh, website there. It's there. And we do have a department and a director and counselors there that work, you know, with the students. And they're always recruiting every year because, um, as you mentioned earlier, they do have a summer program for them to get started and to there's a certain criteria of a list of things that they need to do. And one of them might even be getting a job on campus, you know, um, and going for tutoring services. They have a lot of enhancements and it's an extra award, certainly, too. So, um, you know, but there's a whole list of criteria that they have to follow and qualify for, too, to earn also the award. Okay. And I think, um, Ms. Barker, you mentioned someone asked if there's a web link for EOF, but you said you have to go to the actual school to find out. So that's for New Jersey. I know in New York, they have the HEOP program, which is the equivalent of EOF for New Jersey. So any New York or New Yorkers listening, um, that's here at the different schools. And I'm sorry, we don't have any reps from other states on tonight, but it, each school has something similar. So our students, high school uh, seniors, if you're still visiting colleges, when you go on campus, ask to get information on their equivalent of EOF or, or HEOP, you know, if you're out of different states outside of New York and New Jersey. You know, um, any other state program, any other, if you're going to New York, find out what's happening, um, a tax, you know, with their state grant, you know, any of the other, find out what the criteria, what they have as criteria to see if you could be eligible for that. Do they have a separate application? Because you're correct. I'm from the state of New Jersey, from Misa. So I'm talking to you as if everyone's going to stay in the state because, you know, we like to keep the best and the brightest. OK, I'm sorry. I'm off that. But but that brings up a good point in that with state funding, a New Jersey resident going to school in New Jersey, you get to keep that state funding. But if you decide you're going to New York, that state money, that New Jersey money is not going with you and vice versa. The New Yorker who is dying to go to school in New Jersey, you can't bring state of New Jersey state funds, state of New York funds to New Jersey. They're, they're not, we don't have that um, agreement. Although I think up in New England and somewhere in the Midwest, some of the states are interchangeable with the funding, but New York and New Jersey don't have that partnership. So 
you really need to do your homework to look at the financial costs of the schools, how much your family can pay to see where you're going to go. Because it'll be a big difference if you're going to lose $5,000 going to another state. So really important um, thing to discuss as a family where you will be going. So parents, it's really important that you're talking with your children when this financial aid process is, is going on. Um, so let, let's let's talk about now the students once they get into school. What support are they getting from their financial aid office as far as thinking about the loans and then later on graduating? What are some things students should make sure they do or conversation they should have with the financial aid office while they're currently a college student and then to prepare for graduation and or loan forgiveness later on? Okay, um, I'll start. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I know at Hudson, um, what happens is when the FAFSA uh, comes in, um, there's an alpha. You're assigned by alpha, whatever the letter, first letter of your last name is. That's how your advisor is assigned, and everybody has a financial aid advisor, okay, that they can come in and talk to. They can just come in, they don't need to make an appointment. Um, you know, and sp sit down and speak with their advisor. But also uh, we have the portal, the HCC portal, where once a student enrolls, they are, um, pre are go can go into their portal where all of the information on everything is there, okay? We use Liberty Link, it's called Liberty Link. It's a self-service site that they can go to and get all the information they need what they need to do to complete their file, if they've been selected for verification, what documents are needed, how much their bill is, um, how much their awards are, um, how much, you know, what they're enrolled in. All of that information is in what we call the Liberty Link self-service so that all the student has to go in there and they click on each box, whether they're making satisfactory academic progress, what's needed to complete their file, what's needed to enroll, uh, set an appointment with advising to register if they want to test, you know, all of that information is there. And we have orientation, of course, to um, to the school. And I think eventually we're going to go back to in-person, but we have one online. And I think we had a several in-person ses in sessions uh, this uh, semester. We're getting back to doing a lot more things in person so they can come to orientation and they'll meet people from all the different departments, um, not only on the student services side, but also on academic side too. And they'll get information on tutoring that's available, advising for whatever reason. So um, they can certainly come in and talk to somebody, make an appointment. They can even do a Zoom meeting with someone. Even if they're having trouble completing the FAFSA application, they can do a, a Zoom meeting with the support person and they'll walk them, guide them through the process. So all of that is available uh, for them. And then there's also different features. Called, there's one called the eval. Once a student is in a major, it'll be like a checklist of all the courses that they need to take to graduate. So all of that information is there as they complete a class it's marked complete in progress, what they're taking now and the future courses that they need to do. So that's through the advising department to help guide them through that too. So they're on a path to uh, complete their, pro their degree and to graduate, okay? And you know, there's information sent to register for the next semester, like November 1st is when we reg start registering for the spring, information will be sent to them and in through their uh, email address that they're assigned. And I know they get a tremendous amount of emails there, but they have to learn to sort through that, you know, to go through the self-service and, you know, have dates. Like you said, October 1st, you file your FAFSA. On November 1st, you go and register for next semester's classes. So there's timelines, you know, there. So um, all of that information is available to them so that they can stay on track because once a student starts, we want to retain them. We want to make, we're very focused on student success. So we will do everything in our power. We have so many support services available 
to food insecurities if they have. We have a, a food pantry. We have Hudson Helps if they're having any, if they're in crisis, we have mental health services. So we have all of these support services there. All they have to do is ask and take advantage of it. So all of that information is on our website, all of the places to go, where they're located, the phone numbers, email addresses, everything is there to ensure that they're successful in their program because we want to see them graduate. Okay, so that was the advertisement for Hudson. <laughs> so, um, you know what the schools um, do and it's federally mandated is something called satisfactory academic progress, right? The students have to meet that. So if the student is not on course to graduate, you know, within the allotted time, for instance, if they're not meeting 24 credits within the year, or they have lower than a 2.0 grade point average. Now we say, wait a minute, um, we're going to put you what you could either, you can be denied financial aid, right? Because you're not meeting satisfactory academic progress where the schools have where you can put it in the pill, if it's good enough, you know, then you will get another shot at that. But students, you have to stay on course and able to receive financial aid, okay? We're not gonna let you just go out and get all of these loans or anything like that when you're not progressing in school, where that pathway for you to graduate, where you're slipping on that. And that's where the services, come into play. If you feel as though you're slipping in your class or things like that, schools have tutoring, right? You you sign up for it. It's, uh, as I say, it's a whole family affair. And when you're in school, that is your family. That's an extension of your family, okay? So yes, there are federal guidelines put in place. Universities, the institutions, they have guidelines put in place because we don't want you to waste your money or your parents' money. We don't want you to waste your time or the school's time, I guess. I hate to say sound like that, but we're here for you and we want you to stay on course and we want you to graduate with least amount of debt as possible. Okay, so yes, there are those things that's put into place to assist students. Um, also, Jamila, you bring up a really excellent point. Um, one thing to remember is there's a, a, a limit to Pell eligibility. You have up to what we call 600%, meaning if you go full-time in the fall and full-time in the spring and you're funded with a Pell grant, you meet 100%, okay? So basically we give you six years to complete your bachelor's degree, okay? So um, that's a good point uh, to pay attention to that. And every time there is a Pell disbursement made, it tells you the percentage that you have used, okay? So it's on your FAFSA application when you receive your, what we call a student aid report, your SAR, after you file the FAFSA, there will be a notation there of how much you have used in regard to your Pell eligibility. So it's important to maintain academic progress because you don't want to be continual. You can be funded again if you failed a class or didn't do well. You can receive funding for it again, but eventually it's going to run out or eventually we're going to say no. We do give you two chances for appeals, you know, and all. If you're not, don't have a, a 2.0 average or if you're not maintaining a pace of 67%, what we call, meaning you need to be successful 67% of the time in your coursework. So if that doesn't happen, we give you two chances to pull it up and make it uh, and meet those requirements. But then eventually we will not fund you anymore if you're not making progress in your program. So those are important things to, um, you know, pay attention to. Plus, if you start out at a community college, want to go on and get your bachelor's degree, don't use all up all of your Pell eligibility at a community college because it's going to be more expensive at a four-year college and you want to have some left over to, to use it to get your degree. So also with the student loans, 
there are limits to um, the amount of loan money that you can take as an undergraduate to get your bachelor's degree. So you need to pay attention to that too. So um, those are, and like we both said, there are the tools there to help you to be successful. We have tutoring, advising, we are all there to support you to be successful. We'll only know if you need help, if you ask, okay? So make friends in the departments. Um, when you're going into the financial aid office, please, there's no yelling. Um, you can't force anyone to give you money that you're not eligible for, okay? Because there are the policies, the procedures, there's the regulations, but Speak nice to us, please. We don't want to be yelled at just like you don't want to be yelled at. So ask, and we're here to help. Oh, definitely. I, I can just imagine some of the um, attitudes and loudness that walks into the office or phone calls where people are just yelling for no reason, as if you're sitting with a pot of gold at your desk, being able to just divvy it up at, at will. That's not how it happens. So I, I wanted to um, piggyback over, off the, the time frame. So what, what happens, say a student decided they wanted to be a biology major, and now they're in year three, and they decide to switch their major. We were saying that there's, there's limits in, in aid. So does that go like for six years you have? I know you mentioned the six years, but how does how does how does that work? That they end up, you know, they switch their major. Now they're going to be in school longer than than four years or whatever. So how how does that work? It's not six years for everything, okay? So they're each um, grant. They have their own. There's um, the own limits on how many semesters. For instance, with tag, if you're at a County College, there's four, I'm sorry, five semesters, right? So if you're eligible, you can have five semesters unless, unless you're an EOS student, right? Going to a four-year institution, then there's up to nine payments unless you're a County College transfer or EOS student. So the amount of payments will vary depending on the grant that you are speaking to okay so let's keep that in mind please it's not a one-time fits all for all of the programs every every program has their own eligibility requirements and there's a certain length of time a certain amount of payment that you are allowed so you decide when you're in your third year that you want to switch majors well first you have to talk to the academic advisor right? You have to make sure if you've created some type of relationship with the faculty member, all right, you'll speak to them. Financial aid will be able to discuss with you the ramifications of switching majors, okay? The academic advisors, they'll discuss with you academically, okay, how many of your credits can switch over to your new major so that you'll know how long that you're still left there in school to fulfill that. However, talk to financial aid to see how that decision affects your eligibility for financial aid. Good point, because I don't think a lot of times that students have that discussion with the advisor. And if they do, a lot of times they definitely don't talk to financial aid. And so they're in a bind because they decided to switch the major and there's differences in, in monies. So when we were talking about the, the Pell Grant, um, you were saying that if when you're in community college, you don't wanna use up all your Pell at a community, if you're community college, if you're planning to go to a four-year school. So are you able to, um, I guess, deny a certain amount? Like say they award you 3,000, can you say, well, I only wanna take 1,500? So how, how would you be able to, to do that? How does that work? Well, um, you can refuse the aid if you want to. 
you can, but it's like, say you were awarded the $3,000 for the fall semester. You would just, you know, you would write us a letter saying that you don't want to accept that Pell Grant um, for that semester. You can do that. You do have that option. Not many people do that, but um, you do have the option. I think I was more emphasizing for people to be successful and, um, you know, and not to, because I mean, supposedly you spend two years, maybe two and a half years at a community college, then you go on to the four year schools and spend another two years or maybe two and a half years. However, I just want students to be aware of that they have up to the 600%. And if they are going part-time, meaning they're only taking six credits or nine credits, you're not going to use up 150% for that semester. It'll be a, a, a calculation of the percentage, okay? So um, I, I just find it easier to talk in 100%, you know, 50% one semester if you're full-time, 50% the other semester, that's 100% for the fall and spring semester. But again, too, there is year-round Pell, which you can get for the summertime, but it also adds on to your lifetime, what we call the Pell lifetime eligibility. So if you get another 50% during the summer, that means for that award year, you used 150% of your Pell eligibility already, okay? So, um, and there's no extension, well, not at this time anyway, it's still at 600%. So maybe they'll change it down the road, but you can't you can't bank on that. So um, I just want students to be aware of the calculation and the percentage that they're using, so they don't so that they are successful. Because every time you can get funding if you fail to class and repeat it, you can get funding for that. But it also goes towards the six hundred percent of the lifetime eligibility. Okay, I just want payment, to not amount. Okay, so let's think of it that way. It's the amount of payment you receive. So if you're going to deny um, $1,000 out of a $2,000, no, that's not going to add a, um, give you another additional payment that you can have. Okay, so don't deny, I mean, for instance, we tell kids when it comes to tuition aid grant for the state, right? If you can pay, if you can pay out of pocket, then save that payment so that when you get to the four-year institution, if you're at a two-year institution, right, save it for then. Um, and that's what you're talking about, right? Saving payment so that, but it's not taken a less amount of that grant to save it for later because financial aid does not work like that. We look at payment. And it also too, which brought to my mind, um, sometimes we um, put the award amount uh, before a student registers and it's showing like the maximum amount of the award that they'll get for that semester. And then they, but it's really based on how many credits that they enroll, that's based on full-time going 12 credits, the maximum amount, but then say they only register for six credits. So the amount is cut in half of that award. And they call us and they say, well, can I have that other half of it in a refund? Or can you put that towards the summer, you know, cause I'm gonna take credits there. They don't, <laughs> it's prorated to the amount of credits. That's what the award is. So uh, we can't transfer anything around. <laughs> Okay, I just I just wanted to clarify the question because I in my mind I, I didn't quite get it, so I wanted to make sure that some in the audience who who were possibly thinking the same got the clarification if they were afraid to ask the question. So let, let's move to some of the questions from the audience. So uh, there's a question about financial aid for TPS and other categories of undocumented students. I think we answered that before, but. Some folks might have come late. So if we can address that again, if you're a TPS or undocumented, um, if you're either one of those categories of students, what aid is available for you? 
for undocumented students, well, undocumented students are not eligible for federal funding. Okay, so for the Pell Grant, SCOG, College Work Study, um, no, students are not eligible to complete that application. However, for New Jersey, New Jersey residents, at least 12 um, months or more going to school to a New Jersey tag eligible institution, yes, we have an application called the New Jersey Alternative Application. So when you go onto our website, there's gonna be approximately four questions, right? It's gonna say, have you attended a New Jersey high school for at least three years? Did you graduate from that high school? Um, it's also gonna ask, well, of course, are you a US citizen, eligible non-citizen, right? So long as you say no to those, we're gonna allow you, oh yeah, and there's a question where you have to sign an affidavit to say your plan is to actually apply for citizenship. So if you can answer all of those questions, yes, I attended uh, New Jersey High School for three years. Yes, I've graduated. I am an um, undocumented student. And yes, I plan on applying for citizenship. will allow you to go on to complete the alternative application. And then you're treated um, as any other applicant for state aid. So whatever the requirements are for um, income, for instance, in order to receive New Jersey funding, when we're looking at the application, the FAFSA application for students, you have to have verifiable information. That's for state. That's not for federal. So think about it, all right? There's different eligibility requirements based on the different programs that you're attending. So when I say verifiable income, can you prove whatever the wages are, right? Whether it's you filed a tax return, um, you reported information to the IRS, or is there any social security benefits that were received? Right. If you answer yes to one and you can show us that, yes, you received the social benefit, um, TANF, SNAP, WIC, or um, any child support received, things of that nature, SSI, um, then, yeah, you're going on, we're considering you for financial aid. You're going through the same um, calculation as, you know, citizens or eligible non-citizens. So, yes. For New Jersey um, residents that's attending New Jersey institution, New Jersey has an alternative application that you can find on www.hesaa.org. Thank you for that answer. And another question is asking, what if you didn't finish high school? So I'm guessing you're not a traditional high school graduate in the country, or so are GED eligible, or let's say you, you, you come to the country and you're 20 years old, but you didn't do high school in this country. So how does aid work for those folks? Um, well, if you, complete, if you completed high school in your country, you would need to give us a copy of your uh, diploma. And if it's in another language other than English, you would need an English translation. Um, or if you've never finished high school, you can go and take the GED, you know, through the state. Um, is there any other way, Jamila? Um, well, that's an initiative. No, there's a big When you... Um, apply for the institution, admissions will determine whether or not there's a high school equivalent if you don't have a high school diploma. So yes, GED um, is a high school equivalent um, to that. But go to the college if you've already completed um, high school in your country and then you come to the state, um, talk to the colleges and they'll tell you some colleges or even some four-year institutions. You can actually 
um, take classes there. Now, no, the, the, the financial aid is not there. But they'll help you go along to get your um, GED. So, like I say, the schools, we're all here. Let me just say one thing, though. When we're discussing state funds, that's for students that have established New Jersey residents. So just know the New Jersey fund. If a student comes to the state, to New Jersey, and they have not lived here, established residency, both students and parents, then you're not going to be eligible for New Jersey funds because for New Jersey, the major thing is residency. Okay? But you have to ask. That's New Jersey. That's not federal. Okay? Because there, there's that difference between federal and state. I hope I answered it. I think so. Um... Well, on that note, thank you so much, ladies. I think we covered a lot of information in this hour and almost hour and a half. So I'm hoping our audience was able to get some nuggets of information. Again, we want to say there's money out there. Make all your deadlines. Make your financial aid office person your friend. Ask them any questions you need prior to applying while you're in the process. And then once you're in school, use them as a resource and a support for you because they want you to be successful. They want you to finish in four years or, or less if, if that's possible. So definitely make sure you avail yourself of all the opportunities that are available. Um, my email is down there. If anyone has any questions, you can join the College Cafe um, email distribution because we are constantly sending out information regarding scholarships that are available. There is lots of money available in this country. You, you cannot believe how much outside of the schools um, financial aid information from different companies, private institutions, nonprofit organizations. So avail yourself of all these opportunities. Um, and so <clears throat> on that note, again, we want to thank Ms. Jamila Barker from HESA, Ms. Christine Peterson from Hudson County Community College for spending this time with us in providing all this amazing information on the financial aid process. And I'm Dr. Ketsia Sadler from College Cafe, moderating the College Planning with the National Alliance for the Advancement of Haitian Professionals College Webinar Series. And again, we'd like to thank our partners in Shokalela, Book It Right Accountancy, Golden V, and Parent Matters for helping us with this series. And so everyone, we want to say thank you, have a great night, and we will see you again. Take care and bye-bye.